Back in December, I attended the Patterns of Fashion Festival hosted by the School of Historical Dress. The School of Historical Dress is the organisation that, among other things, publishes these, the Patterns of Fashion books. And the two-day academic conference-style festival was to celebrate that all four original Patterns of Fashion books were now republished in new expanded editions. I filmed absolutely nothing at the festival itself, because one, you don't film other people without their consent, that's not how we do things, but two, it hadn't even occurred to me at the time that I would want to make a video about this. It was something cool and exciting, and I had YouTube money burning a hole in my pocket that I did not especially want to pay taxes on. And I do want to point out that the barrier to attending this event was not being an expert on historical dress, or an academic, or anything like that. It was just being able to buy a ticket and be in London for two days. And yet I got so much amazing information out of those two days, and while I can absolutely point you at all the patterns of fashion books and say, yes, you should get these books, you should get these books, you should get the expanded editions of these books. I resisted for so long, but side by side the new ones have so much more in them. I think they're absolutely worth it. Maybe I'll do a side by side comparison at some point. I don't know how I manage that with copyright and everything, but whatever, future problem. While I can point you at the books, a lot of the information is just not in these books, or it's not in the old editions, or it's going to be in a book that isn't out yet, or it's in some different books that you may not have found yet or you see where I'm going with this. Live events are inherently ephemeral and not accessible to everyone, and I was so inspired by the presentations of everyone at the festival that I want to inspire all of you to go and find their research and read their books and throw money at the School of Historical Dress so that they finish Patterns of Fashion 7 and 8 as soon as possible. I think we're planned up to 9? So while I could not begin to communicate all of the things I learned that weekend, in this video I want to tell you 10 facts I learned at the Patterns of Fashion Festival, and an idea of what going to a festival like this is like. If you've never been to a semi-academic small historical costume event before, which hardly anyone has, this was the first ever Patterns of Fashion Festival. It might be hard to imagine what going to an event like this was like, and I understand that's an access barrier for some people. You can watch other people's vlogs of conventions or going to costume college, but usually there's not so much information on more academic conferences. That's kind of intimidating, like how does it work? What do you do? The Patterns of Fashion Festival worked much the same as small fan conventions that I have been to, as well as academic events. I bought a ticket online, I got confirmation of that by email, and also an email close to the event itself with some basic information on timings, availability of food, the address for the venue, all that sort of information. I'm not local, so I travelled down to London the day before and stayed in a hotel that was not associated with the event. I just picked one I'd stayed in before that was close to an underground station. Then Friday morning I travelled to the venue, which was Conway Hall, a really interesting place in its own right, but that's a... you don't really need to hear anything I have to say that starts with the words, so Bertrand Russell, right? Cool place. And I got myself breakfast along the way because feeding and caffeinating yourself is big and clever. The information had said that the building would be open from about 9.45, with the talk starting at 10.30, so I got there at about 10, because I have steadily worked on myself until I am no longer arriving several hours early to things, just in case. There was a desk right at the entrance where they checked your name off on a list, and gave you your name badge and program, and from that point you were pretty much free to wander in and out whenever you wanted. I made sure I knew where the bathroom was, I went into the big hall. There was just one hall, so really easy, not like a big convention where you have to find your way around between rooms. I had a look at the bookshop table, very important, and the displays that had been set up, and I found a seat. This is the point where a lot of other people were there, we all have shared interests. If you want to socialise like hell at this point, by all means do that thing. It is also okay to retreat into your little bubble and just do crafts until the talks start. Probably everyone is lovely and wants to talk to you about your shared love of the thing we are here to celebrate. Many of the people you see having conversations have literally just met. They will include you. You are welcome. Talk to people if you want. I am a complete hermit. I happily talk to people who talk to me. I rarely approach anyone. It's fine if that's also you. It's fine if you talk to no one. It's fine if you make 16 new friends. You cannot screw this up. You'll enjoy the event anyway. You're not missing out if you don't socialise. <laughs> Here's my historical costuming small talk prompts for the fellow socially anxious neurodivergents out there. Say something about the thing you are both looking at, or 
ask which talk is happening next. I like this thing you are wearing. This is especially good if they're in costume because probably there will be follow-up questions. People in costume usually want to tell you about the costume that they made. Were you here yesterday? Are you here tomorrow too? Just a good opener. Did you see this talk? I'm really looking forward to this talk. So do you make slash study historical costumes? You'd be really surprised at some of the answers to this one. Don't go in assuming that everyone there is a dress historian because they're far more varied than that. I mean, I was there, but everyone I talked to was super interesting, all for completely different reasons. And how cool is that? There were gaps between each of the talks so you could get up and move around if you wanted. There were lunch and dinner breaks to go out and get food. Timings changed constantly on the day, so basically just like every event I've ever been to, there wasn't a lot of downtime, but there was enough I was glad I had brought a small hand sewing project. Some people took notes or photos of slides, some people knitted through every talk, some people just sat and listened. Was it minorly chaotic? Yes. Was it stressful? No, not really. Did it feel welcoming? Yes, everyone was just delighted to be there. It didn't feel like there were cliques or anything. Were there demands on me as an attendee? No, nobody expected anything of me except being quiet when the speakers were talking and showing up and leaving at the right times. But those were clearly communicated every time they changed. Could it have been more diverse? Yeah, I mean, have you looked at historical costuming? <laughs> But as previously stated, the main barrier to entry for this event was money. And that unavoidably skews your demographics. All things considered, it could have been worse. So with all of that in mind, what were the talks about? There were a lot of talks. This was a two day event with an evening tacked on. I'm not gonna talk about all of them. I have cherry picked some of my favorites and the ones that had sort of fun snacky facts in them, which is not to say the ones that were about very detailed explorations of research. One talk was on the evidence surrounding the manufacture of specifically printed fabric for a specific style of dress in the 1860s. This guy, you know this lady here. This was a whole sub-style of dress that was incredibly common at the time. The fabric for it was specially printed. You had two different designs, one for the ruffles and then one for doing everything else in. And there was a whole load of research about the specific mills that were producing that fabric and then the lengths in which they were sold. And from that we can determine like how popular the dresses were and how much fabric you needed to make one or how much fabric the manufacturers thought you needed to make one. Really interesting in-depth research, not so good for giving you a snacky fact on the internet. I have cherry picked a couple of the talks that had very, very good snacky facts. Absolutely not a judgment on how interesting or useful those talks were. Just getting that out there. The butt hugging hoes of 15th century Italy were really like that. The very first talk of the first day was by Thessie, Schoenholzer, Nichols, and looked at funerary and reliquary costume from 15th and 16th century Italy. There was a lot of really interesting information about the process of evaluating, or in some cases re-evaluating, very fragile surviving garments. For example, one item was presented in the museum collection as a pair of capes, but seems more likely to be some kind of gaskins or pumpkin pants. And I particularly enjoyed the level of provenance attached to many of these garments, where we know who wore and sometimes was buried in them. It was a wonderful insight into the process of studying historical clothing. But my one fun fact from this talk is that when you see these very defined bottoms in 15th century art, that correlates to a time when hose was being cut with a straight line at the centre back seam, not a curve, which would give you this very shapely wedgie effect. 17th century dresses had more linen pieces than you think. Emma Marantet presented her master's thesis on studying and then recreating a complete outfit of a young girl who was dressed sometime in the 1630s. There was so much interesting information about the different layers of clothing and how they had been constructed and then also dressed, which is often context we don't get. There was also some live troubleshooting of her completed reconstruction, which was super interesting, but also I would have died. Uh, Emma handled it like a hero. One thing that stood out to me is that when you get images of 17th century women's dress, the descriptions attached to them, often people will describe it as, oh, all that linen, Place, that's the chemise. The chemise was super decorative and elaborate. 
And on this outfit, it wasn't that at all. All these bits of linen and lace were separate. The chemise or shift was very plain and each cuff, ruffle, neckband, undersleeve was a separate piece that was pinned on. Now this was the clothing of a young girl and it's only one outfit, but it does make logical sense that you would make those parts separate and not part of the garment you need to wash often and also probably sleep in. We might be making our lives difficult by trying to have all these super elaborate chemises that we need to disassemble when we wash them. Pocket slits didn't disappear in 1791. The next talk I want to reference was by Hilary Davidson. I love her books on Regency fashion and her talk was about the evolution of women's gowns between 1790 and 1820. So there was so much really great information about the shifts in cut, construction, attitudes towards dressing and consumption and material culture that you can all learn about by reading her books. Have I mentioned they're good? The one snacky bite size fact I picked out for you all was that contrary to what some people on the internet say, pocket slits didn't immediately disappear as soon as waistlines rose. And there's actually evidence of pocket slits in some dresses well into the 1800s. The Georgian royals tackled PR crisis through clothes. Historically, royals have always used clothes as a matter of swaying public opinion. But in this instance, I'm talking about the early 19th century. I think because of well, romance novels, really. People can underestimate the level of mass social unrest in Britain between the French Revolution to, well, many years after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Conspicuous consumption by the upper classes in this period was seen as something that might incite the populace to revolt. Which is why it was very interesting to watch Zach Pinsent talk through the dressing of the Windsor uniform, which is basically what the royal family came up with as a socially acceptable alternative to expensive silks, almost to make themselves look maybe not more relatable, but certainly less outrageously wealthy at a time when revolution in Britain seemed uncomfortably possible. Even flat patterns reflect the body. Another master's thesis, another new set of ideas. Powell Tomaszewski reconstructed a Madeleine in V&A dress from 1921 or 22 and looked at the fact that there are two flat patterns available for this dress, one by Betty Kirk and one by Janet Arnold. It's this one. Again, you, you probably, you know this guy. You know the stress. I'm wildly oversimplifying, but the gist is the Betty Kirk pattern is very geometric, very regular, and the Janet Arnold pattern is not. Through experimenting with reconstructing the dress, Powell found that while the very geometric regular pattern made sense in theory, in practice, bodies aren't shaped that way. The Janet Arnold pattern reflected how the dress was cut to hang correctly on the body, not in the abstract, but probably draped on the stand or a model. Just because that's how it was done doesn't mean it's a good idea. One of the dressings or undressings that happened at the evening event was English men's court dress from 1535. Specifically, this was based on a portrait of Henry VIII. And I'm just including this because it makes me feel vindicated. Tudor doublets from around that time are cut with the back collar all in one piece with the back. And if the School of Historical Dress and the Tudor tailor agree on this, I think it's probably pretty well evidenced. And uh, it sucks. It does not lay nicely. It's not comfortable. It doesn't fit well. I thought because I have a pronounced curve at the back of my spine, it might possibly help with that. No, it's it's way worse. It's impossible to fit properly, or at least very challenging. And like four ex-globe costume experts in the room agreed with me that it's not just me, the design is not good. Aside from anything else, even the Tudors stopped doing it like a decade later. I think it's really good to be reminded that sometimes that is the correct historical way of doing something and that is the best way of doing something are not the same thing. <laughs> People still made weird choices in the past too. Stays go over panniers. You ever get one of those moments where someone shows you something about historical costume and you go, oh, yes, I've literally always done it the other way, but I don't know why. And that would actually make a lot more sense. If you put your stays on top of your pannier or pocket hoops or bum pads, you get a nicer, smoother line at the waist. And once I started looking, that seems to be how it's done in historical references. I always put my hoops on top like the Victorians do. And then when it looked like garbage, I was like, well, I don't exactly have womanly hips. Neither did they. It was the wrong way round. Eleanor of Toledo's shoulder strap is curved. 
This is one of those incredibly niche subjects that will be mind-blowing to a small subset of people in this audience, but <laughs> Luca Costigliolo gave an incredible talk for the revised version of Patton's Fashion 3, the School of Historical Dress, working from Janet Arnold's research, was able to massively revise the patterns taken from the Medici clothing found in Florence. The initial patterns were taken before a lot of conservation had happened, and so there was a lot of distortion and speculation, and the revised patterns come with a lot more information and research, as well as corrections to the shapes themselves, including the famous grave dress of Ellen Nora de Toledo, which has been often reconstructed, and if, like me, and apparently also like Luca, you have struggled at length to get the shoulder strap to fit properly, you are not wrong, it is supposed to be curved, not straight. Which makes complete sense, right? If you look at my kirtle pattern, which is kind of similar, that's the shape you need to fit around a human body. But it's nice to have it confirmed in the literature. <laughs> 18th century dress classifications are not as clear-cut as you think. If you've been around historical costuming for a long time, you probably remember the days when it was a robe à la française or a robe à la l'anglaise, and the fronts are like this, and the sleeves are like this, and the backs are like this, and never the twain shall meet. I can vividly remember getting into an online argument in like 2009 because I didn't have enough fabric, so I wanted to make a dress with a stomacher front and a fitted back, and that was not allowed. We've got a lot better since then. There's a lot more access to information, more online museum collections, we know there are more than two kinds of dresses, but people can still be a bit of a stickler about, oh, well, you shouldn't have that kind of sleeve with that kind of back. Which is why I loved Sebastian Passo taking us through the family tree of dresses in Patterns of Fashion 6, showing the diversity of styles available and how they relate to and cross over with each other. It's not always obvious what a dress should be classified as, and different styles mix and match sometimes. And of course, emphasising that this is not, and never will be, an exhaustive catalogue. Just because it's not on these two pages doesn't mean it doesn't exist, or never existed. Always be open to something new. Jenny Tiramani gave a great talk about the tablier, a half petticoat, a sort of apron you could wear instead of a petticoat with 18th century dresses. It just fills in that gap at the front without having to wear a whole other garment. Never heard of it before? No, me neither. And indeed, Ginny Tiramani herself basically didn't know they existed, despite having studied lots and lots and lots of 18th century garments, until she finally stopped and went, no, this isn't an unpicked petticoat. The sides are finished with the same thread and the same stitches as the rest of it. This was done deliberately. At which point she started looking for other examples and found some, like not loads, but if you start searching museum archives, you turn up enough that it's clear this isn't a random one-off. This is an item that people knew about and wore. And it's almost completely not represented in historical costuming. This was such a delight to me because it reminded me, and continues to remind me, of two things. Firstly, that no matter how experienced, knowledgeable, or a subject matter expert you are, there's always something new to learn. And secondly, historical costuming is still an emerging field. It hasn't been studied seriously for very long at all. Nothing is set in stone. All the things we know to be true could be changed, updated, or cast in a new light at almost any moment, and we should embrace and celebrate that. Okay, three things. I could not have been sitting on four layers of fabric this whole time. Game changer, seriously. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram to see pictures of my cat, and down in the description box you'll find a link to my Ko-fi page, where you can make a one-off or reoccurring donation to support this channel and the ongoing war between my insatiable desire for new experiences versus my deeply rooted travel anxiety and desire to just stay at home. Ko-fi supporters get early access to all of my videos, the occasional extra sneak peek, and I couldn't do what I do without their help. Dream big, and I'll see you next time.